If you can all take a seat. Solomon's got the scripture reading. Sorry for the late start. We wanted to, some people coming from a distance and a little weather trouble, so we thought we would wait a little longer. About 10 minutes late start, but we'll, we'll get her done. The, um, all the scriptures are in your bulletin. They should be right. Solomon's going to be reading in the place of Kathy. By the way, Kathy sends her greetings. She was going to be here today, possibly with her sister, but uh, they do things different in Indiana. She said it's a mess out there where she lives. The roads are a mess. And um, she said she just couldn't even, she's got country roads to get to a couple of miles, even get on the highway. And uh, she called me last night, said it's just a mess. She wanted to be here so bad. But anyway, she's feeling somewhat better. And uh, she was going to come with Michelle, but uh, maybe, maybe another week or so. Okay. Solomon's got the readings. Good morning. Happy anniversary. <laughs> so we're going to begin this morning with the book of Malachi, chapter 4. Then we're going to read the first six verses this morning. Well, the only six verses, the whole chapter. It's the last book of the Old Testament. For behold, the day comes, it burns as a furnace, and all the proud and all who work wickedness will be stubble. And the day that comes will burn them up, says Yahweh of armies, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in its wings. You will go out and leap like calves of the stall. You shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I make, says Yahweh of armies. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to him and Horeb for all Israel, even statutes and ordinances. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of Yahweh comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And let's read now from Psalm chapter 50 next, the first 15 verses. The mighty one, God, Yahweh, speaks and calls the earth from sunrise to sunset. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty God shines out. Our God comes and does not keep silent. A fire devours before him. It is very stormy around him. He calls to the heavens above, to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear my people, and I will speak. 
Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I don't rebuke you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I have no need for a bull from your stall, nor male goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the livestock on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, the wild animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Will I eat the meat of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Pay your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Amen. How blessed we are. And let's move to the New Testament this morning, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15. Verses 4 through 13. Romans 15, 4 through 13. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that through perseverance and through encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now the God of perseverance and of encouragement grant you to be of the same mind one with another, according to Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore accept one another, even as Christ also accepted you, to the glory of God. Now I say that Christ has been made a servant of the circumcision for the truth of God, that he might confirm the promises given to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Again, he says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. Again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. Again, Isaiah says, there will be the root of Jesse, he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles will hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we're going to finish this morning with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. I'm going to read verses 25 through 36. important message from the Lord today. Jesus is speaking and he says, there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth anxiety of nations and perplexity for the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting for fear and for expectation of the things which are coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is near. He told them a parable. See the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see it and know by your own selves that the summer is already near. Even so you also, when you see these things happening, know that God's kingdom is near. Most certainly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things are accomplished. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So be careful, or your hearts will be loaded down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day will come on you suddenly. For it will come like a snare on all those who dwell on the surface of all the earth. Therefore, be watchful all the time, praying that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will happen and to stand before the Son of Man. Amen. He's made us worthy. Amen. Let's praise God today. Amen. Bless the Lord.
Amen. One of our fine founding members uh, wrote this first song. Uh, gosh, and she's been in heaven probably 10 years, I think. 10? Dorothy? Yeah, 9. Yeah, 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. 07, wow. Beautiful song. Let's stand together and we'll give the Lord glory this morning. Thanks for his faithfulness and what he's working out for us. And God bless uh, Dorothy's memory. Amen. I think she gets royalties on this every time we do it. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. to write poems and then some you give a double dip Lord and enable them to even put it to, put their poems to music thanks for the big lights thanks for the nobodies thanks for using all of us Lord thank you for using all of us we honor you today thanks for making us individuals like snowflakes thank you that our fingerprints are different our voice patterns are different everything about us one to another is different so that we can show forth your glory and praise and a, a rainbow of blessing 
for people round about us that need it. What one color of the rainbow can't do, another can. What the dim light can't bring the answer to, a brighter light can. We thank you, Lord, for candles, for light bulbs, for strobe lights. We thank you, Lord, for indoor, for outdoor lights. We thank you, Father, for all the ingenuity and creativity you put into the body of Christ, setting each member in the body just where he or she needs to be to do what you've called us to do. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. God's wonderful, isn't he? None of us is redundant. We're all one of a kind. Hallelujah. Here's a place of safety. If you have a bulletin that's got a white dove, you're blessed. I got the other one. But uh, that, that white cover is uh, very, very apropos of what I'm sharing today from God's Word. I don't know where Solomon found it. I didn't even see it because it wasn't printed yet. It is perfect. Right out of my Wednesday night experience, I'll be sharing. Praise the Lord. This is a good place to be under the shadow of the Most High. Amen. Under His wings we'll trust. Hallelujah. us know when we get out of the way and help us to always be quiet enough and willing enough to be obedient yes, yes Lord to yes, not Lord. mistake it for something else to not rebuke it <laughs> Amen. to realize when it's you and to obey you 
But what a paradox I am, says the Lord, when you compare me to the things of this world. For under my wings, I will draw you close, and under my wings is the shadow, and under my wings is the light the brightest, and as you draw nearer to me, the light in you will become brighter and brighter also. For there is no darkness in me, not even under my wings, says the Lord, for that is a place of beauty and shelter and closeness with me, says the Lord. And you are welcome to come deeper and deeper and deeper into this shadow, my shadow, where the light is the greatest, Thank says you. the Lord. You know, I've heard some people teaching lately that uh, all the wings of the Lord and all those references are about a prayer shawl. You know, those little tassels and little corner pieces on the prayer shawl, and those, are the, those are the wings. And so he's talking about wrapping his prayer shawl over us. You know what? You cannot find scripture an inch long for that. Do you know what the picture really is? Exactly what Jesus said in the New Testament. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, how I longed. To gather you to myself like what? Like a mother hen with her chicks. The picture is a bird putting, their, putting its wings around its young. That's all that it is. What would you rather have this morning? Let me bring it right down where we live. When the top caves in, the bottom falls out. When everyone in your life, even close friends or folks you thought were, leave you in the lurch, what would you rather have? A prayer cloth wrapped around your head or Jesus embracing you and taking you to his bosom? Which would you rather have? Why settle for anything other than God's best? Amen? His best is himself. His best is his presence. There's nothing like it. Amen? Yes. He's awesome. He's wonderful.
truly is a God of contrast. From a still small voice to the elements melting with fervent heat in the end times. Amazing God. Amazing God. You are the Son of Righteousness. The Holy Lamb. I've brought you this far, says the Lord. From the moment you were as a fellowship, just a seed of my word, I desire to plant a lighthouse for the full gospel here in the northwest of Cincinnati. And did I not let the seed germinate and did I not bring it to birth a year and a half later? And have you not defied the odds and the statistics of man by starting with less? than recommended? Did you not last longer than three weeks or three months? Did you not outlast the six months that the powers that be say is when 95% of new churches fail? Did you not surpass the odds? Did you not continue to grow and glow and go not only around the tri-state, but across America and all around the world. If I brought you to birth, if I caused you to germinate, if I caused you to grow, if I caused you to expand, if I have sustained and provided and protected, will I not continue to care you? Yes, even to the gray hairs, as it were. I am with you to deliver you from anyone and anything that would bring itself up against the work of the Lord that you are. Trouble not yourself about what the eye sees or the ear hears or what the senses behold. For I am far and above the limitations of the natural man. Have you not seen it in three decades that according to man should have never been lived out? Cheer up, look up. The best is yet to come. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to Jesus. Thanks, Father, for all you are and all you've done. Our lives are in your hands. Our fellowship is in your hands. Our families are in your hands. Our outreach ministry, Lord, is in your hands. Use us for your glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can. I want to praise the Lord this morning for his leading. You know, the Apostle Paul was trying so hard to do God's will that he was persecuting Christians. And I'm sure God's still small voice was there in the back of his head saying, stop it, stop it, stop it. But he thought, I don't care what happens. I'm going to keep doing God's will. And that was kind of me <laughs> about two or three weeks ago with the writing lessons. Um, it was like everything was going wrong and, and the more things that went wrong, the more I was determined to see it through. And I kept having this nagging feeling that something wasn't quite right and I rebuked it. <laughs> I just kept plowing through until finally one day it all came to a head and I said, God, I really need to know your direction before I try this anymore. And there it was. It's time to quit for now. And I was so disappointed. What a defeat it seemed like. I had to give up. But instead, it turns out, I'm on vacation. <laughs> so praise the Lord. <laughs> yes, always listen for that still small voice.
So um, I thank you all for your prayers and your help. And uh, everything that is done to me here is done to you, love, and I'm so grateful. That's a good testimony from a first time visitor, then. <laughs> if you don't know her, if you don't know her story, you know, she fell, broke her femur in two places. Long story short, she went from her kitchen to the operating theater in about an hour and a half because of God's, God's grace. And she's on the mend. Amen. Somebody else had one, eh? Monica. Yeah, uh, I was uh, 2 six months free rent. He got a good testimony last week. Anybody else? Got your bulletin with you? Please, if you don't, take one with you. There's a fellowship meal afterwards. Who's got the December birthday besides Esther and myself? Anybody else? We'll split it. Rick sends his greetings. Still fighting the good fight there with some physical challenges, but Esther was able to get here. She got a good cab service. It's uh, Solomon Uber. Uber Solomon. And uh, I'm glad she's, we're so happy to see her. She's with us. She prays for us. She supports us, even though she's not here. We have a number of folks that do that, which really makes the difference. So Wednesday, we're back in our series on the inner light. We'll be looking at uh, spiritual light. This is where we're getting into the gifts of the Spirit, how they operate through that inner light that's within us. Hope you can make it for Wednesday's service from about 7.15 to 8 o'clock. Um, I think that's all we have by way of announcement, and we're going to turn the meeting over now to our guest soloist. She sings like an angel, like a dove. Monica, bless us with the word in song. Can you hold this? Do you hold it? Okay. We'll just put this all the way down out of your way. Bless you, darling. Appreciate okay. it. I didn't know you were ready. <laughs> yeah, in season and out of season. <laughs> situation I believe I believe no matter what the circumstances I believe I believe I stand on your word 
I stand on your promise. I stand on your word. I stand on your promise. My soul says yes. My soul says yes. Even when my faith is weary, I believe, I believe, all I know is that you will answer, I believe, I believe, I stand on your word, I stand on your promise, I stand on your word. I stand on your promise. My soul says yes. My soul says yes. To your will. To your way. I will trust and obey. Yes, to your will. trust and obey I stand on your word I stand on your I stand on your word I stand on your promise my soul says yes I stand on your word I stand on your promise. I stand on your word. I stand on your promise. My soul says yes. Yes. My soul says yes, Lord. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My soul says yes. Hallelujah. That's a good testimony, isn't it? We can have that all the time, no matter what it looks like, what it feels like. Bless the Lord. How many have a Bible with you? Turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. So many things to be thankful for. Wow. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. We started out in a little uh, small room of the senior center, and three months we outgrew that. Moved to the large part of the senior center, used the small one for Sunday school. About uh, six months after that, we moved into the White Oak Center and didn't have such good advertisement there. We were on the side. You had to really be looking for us. You know, we still got people in there visiting. One family came. I said, you know, how do you hear about the fellowship? R lady raised her hand. This was a, there was a flower store right next to us. She said she was praying, Lord, where should I go to church? And the Lord said, go to where the flowers are. She was in the White Oak Center to do something or other, to get in something with a bouquet or whatever. She said, where, what, what, is this a church right next door? God knows how to get you where you need to be. It's just amazing. We were like three years and change there, and then we moved here in 1993, and we're still here. That's quite amazing. If you read the statistics, I appreciate that prophetic word. He doesn't forget them. I do, but uh, the Lord knows the, the statistics. You start a church with less than 50 people, you're about 10 times as likely to fail in the first six months. We started with 30 soon. It's amazing. Most churches are dead, gone after less than a year, most new churches. And a church like ours, in an area where it's one denomination, about 90%, it's impossible. We shouldn't be here. We planted a non-denominational full gospel church in this area where there wasn't any at that time. And my goodness, three decades later, it's just kind of mind blowing. I know you're looking at it from your point of view. If you look at it from the minister's point of view, who kind of knows, you know, the way things go and statistics, I'll tell you what, this is a miracle. If you've never seen a miracle, you're sitting in a miracle right now. We should not be here. We did go smaller. We got bigger. Within the first couple of years, I had three dreams in one year. 
about this fellowship, and the Lord told me there are about 150 to 200 people in this area that need this work. Three dreams, the same way, three in one year. And I was looking in some old directories. We had 160-some members within the first 10 years. So it's like everything God said would happen, happened. And it's been up and down ever since. But, and I don't know how many people have come through and gone back, gone out, and gone, moved, and gone upstairs. But isn't that something? I mean, when God says something, it'll happen. Amen? All we've got to do is be like the Virgin Mary. Be it unto me, according to your spoken word. Just be it unto me. Let it happen. And it'll happen. Amen? Got your Bible? Let's look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Boy, I've been anxious to teach this lesson this morning, the wings of a dove, because of an experience I had here in church two Wednesdays ago. Luke's account of the anointing of Jesus, chapter 3, verse 21. We're going to read just verses 21 and 22. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also, being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Solomon normally does the Lord's Supper on Wednesdays and Sundays, and I do the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of every month, but occasionally we'll switch it up. Two Wednesdays ago, he came to me before the close of service and said, Hey, Dad, how about you doing the communion tonight? I said, Well, I wasn't planning. I said, I really feel like you should. Every time he asked me to do that, something unusual happens. There'll be a prophetic word over the Lord's table or something else will happen. Well, we did the communion and we were done. And I thought, well, okay, it doesn't have to happen every time. And I'm over here. And we were just in the presence of God, waiting on God after we had received the Lord's Supper. And just like that, I had an experience that ranks within the top five spiritual experiences in my 45 years as a believer and 43 as a, as a minister. It was like watching a video or a DVD or a Blu-ray in 4K quality. It was just this quick, boom, it just was suddenly there. In my heart, in my spirit, in my mind's eye, I saw somebody that looked to be about 30 or so years of age. It was a man, dark hair. He had his hands folded like this in prayer, and he bowed his head. And suddenly, suddenly from the right, from the sky, came a white dove making a beeline for this man as he was in prayer like this. And the Spirit of the Lord, like a dove, came and landed, but not on his head. And it wasn't just a little dove or a little turtle dove or a little pigeon. It was not that. It was a full-sized, man-sized dove. My goosebumps got goosebumps. And this dove folded its arms over the man, covering him completely. And the dove's head was above the man's head. That's how large this bird was. And then it looked around, and there was fire in its eyes. I wish I could tell you. I wish I could communicate the emotion that that heavenly being had. It was a million times stronger than the love of a mother for a newborn. Not only was it mind-boggling, unconditional love, but it soon turned to protection. It began to look around as if to say, don't anyone even think about harming this person because you'll have me to deal with. It wasn't a dove then at all. It seemed more like an eagle. And just that quickly it vanished. And I thought, I came to myself and I thought, that's what it means when you and I receive the Holy Spirit. That's what happened when Jesus was anointed and appointed and equipped as the Messiah. This is what happens when God chooses a group of people to be a lampstand, to be a local fellowship. He surrounds that group of people with wings of protection 
and provision and power and a love that is beyond our ability to comprehend or fathom this side of eternity. We're living this out. Look at it with me from the scripture. I don't know about you, but if I have a supernatural experience, I want it to line up with God's word. We're going to test my experience against God's word this morning. The first thing we find, of course, is a man among men and a dove among doves. Look at the text again, Luke 3, verse 21. My paraphrase. But it came to pass that all the people present to be baptized, and Jesus having been baptized and continually praying, the heaven was opened. That dove in my mini vision was a dove among doves, a dove like no other. How many would agree that Jesus is also a man among men, a God man like none other? Think about this. Read the scripture. Nothing unusual, nothing of note happened as all the other Jews and Gentiles and Roman soldiers came to be baptized by John to begin a new life in covenant with the God of Israel, Yahweh. Nothing of note happened. Nothing in particular is mentioned. Why? They were confessing. Jesus was communing. That's good advice for you, for me, for anyone in the body of Christ that seeks this anointing of the dove of heaven. It'll come while you're praying. They were in the upper room for 10 days before Pentecost happened, and they were what? Praying. Read in the scripture. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them who are continually asking him? Some people seek the baptism in the Holy, Holy Spirit. They seek a little bit and then quit. How long should I seek until you find? How long should I ask until you receive? How long should I knock until your mouth is opened with supernatural praise and worship of God? The Bible says the heaven was open, meaning not just the sky, but God's heaven, the place that Paul called Paradiso, the third heaven was opened and that meant something supernatural is about to happen. Can you stand there with these people on that day when Jesus came to be baptized in the Jordan? Can you stand alongside? Can you hear that sound of wind? Can you look up with everybody else and watch the heaven look like it was unzippered? And you don't see stars. You don't see the sun. You see beyond the stars. You see a city sparkling like a diamond. And you see something coming from beyond our solar system. The Bible says, and the Spirit, the Holy One, descended in a bodily form as a dove upon him. The other three gospel accounts do not mention this phrase, in bodily form. They say the Spirit of God came and descended and remained upon him like a dove. In other words, it kind of arrived from outer space. He flew in, as it were, and rested on Jesus. But the other three accounts don't mention in bodily form like a dove. This text specific, specifically does mention it. And in my vision, how big was that dove that came, that landed, that engulfed the man? Life size, man size, beyond the size of any dove or turtle dove or pigeon you ever saw in Fountain Square. Wow. Doves are fascinating creatures. Did you know that they're of the same family basically as pigeons? Doves, turtle doves, pigeons, all from the same fowl family, F-O-W-L. They were highly prized in several of our wars. Did you know that? They were used to carry messages. They were awarded medals, pigeons were, because of their work as soldiers for the government. In the Old Testament, Noah sent forth what after the judgment of the flood? A dove came back, sent it, came back. When the dove finally left and did not return, what happened? Noah and his kin rejoiced because they knew the flood was over, the judgment was over, and there was finally peace on earth to men of goodwill, and there were only less than 10 in that boat. The dove meant peace. In Leviticus chapter 1, verse 14, and other Old Testament scriptures, we find 
that the turtle dove, the pigeon, if you will, the dove is the only bird, the only fowl that is acceptable to Yahweh as a sacrifice for sin. The only bird that is acceptable for sacrifice for the Lord. How many remember Joseph and Mary couldn't afford the normal sacrifice, so they chose what? To dedicate the Lord Jesus. Doves. Doves signify peace. They signify sacrifice, don't they? And I love this. They signify love. Doves signify love. God's love. If you read the Old Covenant carefully, you find in the Song of Solomon, the object of affection is referred to as a dove. I was reading the Psalms the other day, and David says, Lord, rescue your turtle dove. Why would he say that? Because the prophet Hosea records Yahweh likening his beloved nation Israel to a dove. They indicate peace and sacrifice and love. And in this New Testament day and in this outstanding revelation given to us in Luke chapter 3, we find that the dove symbolizes God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity. This was a dove among doves resting upon a man among men. Amen? Let's look a little closer at the wings of a dove. You making this personal today? Are you thinking about asking the Lord to do for you what he did for Jesus? If it's already happened, are you opening your eyes spiritually to allow the Lord to show you something you didn't know happened when it happened? So that you can enjoy something that is your birthright that you haven't maybe been living in the light of? I hope so. And a voice came out of heaven saying, You, you are my son, the beloved one, in whom I have found delight. How many would like to hear the voice of God? Wouldn't that be neat? Can you imagine the crowd gathered there? Jews, Gentiles, Roman soldiers. Did you know that some Roman soldiers were converting to the religion of Israel? Do you remember in some of the other Gospels when the people gathered around John to be baptized? One of the groups of people were soldiers and they said, and what should we do? What's that about? That's about Roman soldiers converting to the God of Israel, Yahweh. What should we do? There were Jews, there were Gentiles, there were Roman soldiers all gathered around this rough and ready prophet, the second cousin of our Savior, the one we know as John the Baptizer. And they all heard the same thing. They heard the voice of God. If watching the sky open and watching the stellar heavens open and seeing into the very paradise of God wasn't enough, everybody present when that dove came from heaven to descend and remain upon Jesus heard the audible voice of God. I was looking at my New Testament the other day and I had written my Greek guru Dr. Phil, about something related to our text this morning. And when I finished the email, I took out my Greek text, Testament, and I'm looking at it. And I thought to myself, what kind of a God do we have that allows us to hear his voice? Solomon has studied four different uh, courses in biblical Hebrew. I said, what's that feel like, Solomon, to open up Old Testament Look at the words and say the words that Yahweh spoke and realize you're listening to the voice of God. Oh, what, what good is the Bible? Dusty, musty old book. What good is the Bible? This book contains the voice of God. Oh, I'd love to hear the voice of God. You can. It's as close as a Hebrew Old Testament or a Greek New Testament. You can look at it. You can read it if you have access to the alphabet. You can say it. You can hear yourself say it. And you too, like the people there gathered at Jesus' baptism, can hear the voice of God. Here's what they heard. See, see, e o yosmu. What? That voice came not to the Jews and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and the Gentiles, and the Roman centurions. That voice was about the carpenter, the one that the dove had landed upon him only. 
See, see, e o ios mui. You, you are my son, o agapitos, the beloved. Can't you picture that? What if you were fixing to go into a ball game or a movie theater amongst a big crowd and that happened? And suddenly the crowd disperses, the heaven opens. You see this huge dove making a beeline, not for you or the person next to you or in front of you or behind you, but to this person that nobody even noticed. And suddenly there's a spotlight on that person. And that dove lands on that person and enfolds that person with its wings. And if that's not enough, the walls of the building begin to shake. You find your knees shaking. You feel like somebody removed your bones. You're just staggering under a power that you're not acquainted with. And then you hear in your own language a voice from heaven pointing this person out as the son of God, the beloved. And if that were not enough, and see, Evdokisa, in you, I found delight. Wow. Wow. It was after Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit that he was publicly affirmed as God's son. He was the son of God from eternity. He's been God, the son from eternity, but he was publicly affirmed as the son of God through the coming of the dove. And the voice of God spoken over him. He was sealed. As John the Beloved says in his gospel, the, the Lord gives to Jesus the Holy Spirit without measure. How many like that? That'd be like getting a gift card. Unlimited gasoline. Unlimited petrol for your car. Longest day you live or have you a car. Unlimited power. Oh, and some of us get like Labrador dogs. We read that. <laughs> oh, if only. If only he had the spirit without measure. Wouldn't it be something if we could? I guess I'll have to settle for what that evangelist is bringing. Oh, I hope I can get a seat. He said, if we come early and get in the first five rows, he'll give us a double portion. Double portion. <laughs> Who wants that? The other preachers down the road. He's going to give us the Moses anointing that came on the 70 elders. Moses anointing. <laughs> What good is that? And there's another preacher. He'll give you the triple dip because he's going to pray over you in, in Hebrew and he'll have the shawl on. Brother, when I, when I get her done, I get her done. All of that mess is less than what you and I have. If you can take this in this morning, we have the identical anointing that Jesus had. That's why Acts 5 says, that Peter and the apostles got the same results as our Christ when they brought the sick to them. And they were being healed, each and every one. The works that I do shall you, you do also, and even greater works. Isn't that what Jesus said? He's not stingy, is he? Anything he has, he shares. Now, this was no turtle dove. This was no pigeon. The Bible says that Jesus, John, and the crowds saw something, didn't they? They saw the Spirit of God like a dove. All three versions of the gospel say that, but this one only adds this detail. In bodily form, in bodily fashion. O see, as, just like, as, just like, in bodily bodily fashion, somatikun, pertaining to the body. What is the master saying? It didn't just fly like a dove, this experience. The Spirit of the Lord didn't just arrive like a bird of the air. He looked like one. My brother, my sister, I submit to you that he came upon Jesus. He comes upon you. He comes upon me. He comes upon any and every believer who seeks this anointing in the same way, not as a little turtle dove or a little pigeon, as lovely as they are, but as a man-sized bird, large enough to enfold us, not just our head or our hand or our shoulders, but our entire person under his wings. We're living what Jesus wanted for the Jews of his day, literally living it out. Do you believe that? 
Well, what makes you think that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. In Acts chapter 8, verse 16, the story of the Samaritans receiving the anointing of the Spirit. In Acts 10, 44, and, and, and Acts eleven fifteen, 15, the story of the household of Cornelius, Gentile, Roman believers receiving the, the Holy Spirit. In all three verses, it says the Spirit of God, when He came, fell upon them. If you weren't here when I said it, this is your lucky day, as I'm saying it again. That phrase, fell upon in Acts 8, 10, and 11, is the identical word Jesus used in his story of the prodigal son. When the repentant boy finally comes home, the old man jumps off the porch and runs toward the prodigal son. The Bible says he hugged him. It's the same word. Get the picture? When I came back from Australia, living as a full-time missionary, I went to visit my mom and dad in their apartment in Pittsburgh. And when I walked in the room, the first thing my dad did was enfold me. He fell upon me. He didn't pat my head. He didn't shake my hand. He didn't punch my shoulder good on you. He encircled me with his arms and hugged me to himself. That's exactly what it means. The Samaritans and the Gentiles and the household of Cornelius and the prodigal son all received a hug and the Holy Spirit expressing the Trinity's feminine quality, if I may say, embraced Jesus and he embraces us. And he cares more than any mother hen. He protects more and better than any mother bear. He loves us with a love that absolutely blows our mind. Any other scripture for that? Pastor, I sure want to believe it. Yeah. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 49. Before Jesus went back to heaven, he said, wait here. Do you know what actually means sit? How many are sitting? You could have the experience that the disciples had on the day of Pentecost. Sometimes we think they were dancing or shouting or jumping. They were sitting. He said, sit in Jerusalem. Sit. Sit. I prayed for a lady in Australia that didn't want to fall over. Everybody I touched was falling over. Sometimes they just get close, fall over, point at them from a distance. They'd fall over. She said, I don't want that. She's fixing her coif, coif here, you know. I don't want that. She said, can I receive the Holy Ghost without falling? I said, well, I don't, I don't cause it. I, I can't, I'm not in charge of that. She said, well, there must be a way. I don't want to fall. I said, well, why don't you sit down? Oh, they always come to the front, don't they, and stand. I said, well, yeah, but you don't have to stand. You can sit down. Really? I said, sure. They were sitting on the day of Pentecost. I hadn't thought about that. I said, that's what they happened on the day of Pentecost. They were sitting. She said, I can just sit right here. I said, yeah, sit, sit right here. She said, okay, let's have it. So I prayed for her. She fell over sideways. <laughs> she just couldn't beat it. The Lord said, you don't have to fall down. You can fall sideways. I was preaching in France. People were falling left, right, and center. They were getting upset about it. They hadn't seen it. And it was a full gospel church. They had to bring some, some old pillows out from the storage room, dust the, yeah, that's when the people used to fall, you know, pick up their head, put it. And the pastor was really a little concerned. And uh, he didn't say anything, but I heard through the grapevine. Pastor's concerned, and all these people falling. What's up with this, you know? And his daughter came for prayer. She stood right in front of me. I thought, oh, here we go. If this girl falls, that tears it for the rest of the meeting, you know. But I thought, I can't help it. I'm not going to push. I don't believe in that stuff. And I prayed for her to receive the Holy Spirit. She prayed with me. I just reached for her. There were lots of people around. I, ne I never even touched her for it. I just reached for her. And they had people on the left, on the right, behind to catch her. She just fell straight down, like an accordion. Boom! And then lay, fell over. And I said, you know, he just looked like this. He thought, well, I never. He thought he had his, all his bases covered. Nobody's going to fall, especially not my daughter. Someone behind, someone on one side, someone on the other. What did the Lord do? Psst, just removed your leg bones. Boom. God can do it. Amen? Luke 24, 49. Jesus said, sit in Jerusalem until, until how long? Until how long? Until you clothe yourselves with power from on high. That's a literal Translation from the original. Until you clothe yourselves with power from on high. How many believe this book doesn't contain God's word? It is God's word. Big difference. A lot of preachers don't know that. 
They think this book contains God's word, but it isn't God's word. And if it talks about science or something else, it's likely it could be wrong. But it's, the word's in there somewhere. Some of it's God's word. We just don't know which. That makes us the judge of the word, right? And the Bible says the word judges us. If you believe this is God's word, not just contains it, doesn't just give you the gist of it. If you believe the very words of that book were inspired by God, then you ought to cheer up. Because it doesn't say that the Spirit of God is going to be a hat for them or a shawl around their shoulder or a belt. It says, clothe yourselves, not your head, not your shoulders, not your hands. Clothe yourselves. Same picture. When the anointing comes, the dove is going to place his arms, his wings around you, all of you. And his head's going to be above your head. And he's going to look down at you with eyes of love. But when the enemy comes, he's going to look up and away from you with eyes like fire. He's going to protect you like no one can protect you. He's going to love you like no one ever has or ever will. You believe it. He's going to enfold our entire person with power, protection, and provision. He publicly affirms us as his own in that moment, just as he did Jesus the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1.22 and Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30, He is the seal. He is the seal that we belong to the Lord. We can say we're children of God, but the anointing is God's outward demonstration, His seal, that what we say with our lips is true of our lives. How many are glad for the seal? Good to be married, isn't it? Don't answer. But what, what wife would want to be married without a wedding ring? What do you need a ring for? We're married. You want the seal. You want it publicly known. Yes? No. Don't answer. Some of you are saying, no. Uh, no. <laughs> you like those guys cheating on their wives, walk into a bar with their, with their hand in their pocket, you know. What's going on? Oh, nothing. Yeah. Keep my hand warm, you know. What's on that hand? Oops. <laughs> You want to be known. Believers want to be known or ought to want to be known as believers. And this anointing, this seal is what demonstrates it. You say, yeah, but Jesus got a voice to go with that anointing. So do we. His came from heaven. But guess what? God is no longer only in heaven. There is one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in us all. It is no longer you that speak, but your Father speaking in you. For with stammering lips in another language will He speak to this people. And so from Pentecost on, the voice doesn't come from heaven. It comes from within us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. When He comes, He brings peace. A dove means peace. John 14, 7. I'll send you the Comforter. He'll abide with you forever. I'll give you my peace, not as the world gives, give I unto you. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love, joy, peace. Just as Moses, I'm sorry, Noah's dove signified peace after the judgment of the flood, when the anointing comes upon us, it signifies that we really are sons and daughters of God, that there is therefore now not even one bit of condemnation for us since we're in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good news? How do we know that? Because John 14, 17 says, the Lord's going to give us, his children, another comforter whom the world does not possess the ability to receive. An unsaved person can't receive this seal, this anointing, this heavenly dove of protection and power and provision. Only believers, the fact that we have that anointing is proof positive that we're sons and daughters of God. He's also the power of sacrifice. How many believe that? Ever had to do something tough for the Lord? Something your flesh didn't want to do? Did you ever have to say no to something you wanted to say yes to because God didn't want you to? Where do we get that kind of power to say no to the world, the flesh, and the devil? Where do we get that energy, that anointing to say yes to the will of God? Same place Jesus did. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says that Jesus Christ our Savior through the eternal spirit offered himself a sacrifice to God. Doves signify love. They also signify sacrifice. It was the Holy Spirit who gave Jesus the ability to offer himself as our sacrifice. He'll do the same for you. His Holy Spirit's power enables nobodies like you and me and big lights like some of the folks that are on TV and 
in the magazines. It, it, it enables you and me and Big Shots both to serve him and others in his power. And finally, as demonstrating, if I can say it, the feminine quality of the Godhead, he shows us and shares us love. How many have read James chapter 4, verse 5 lately? James is basically telling the church, hey, don't get involved with the world system. Don't start doing things you used to do. That doesn't become you as a believer. You're not in the world anymore. You're, you're, you're not of the world. You're of God. Don't, don't do those things. Don't talk like that. Don't go there. Don't spend your money on that. Don't waste your time. Why? Don't you know that the spirit he has caused to live in us loves us to the point of jealousy? Any parent here get excited when your children go down the wrong road? Does it excite you to see them do something that will harm themselves or someone else? Can you imagine how much more protective the Spirit of God is of us? He loves us, James 4, 5, to the point of jealousy. He doesn't want anyone or anything having control over us but him. I close this morning with a little quote by A.B. Simpson, missionary statesman and founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance denomination. If Jesus is the brother and bridegroom, the Holy Spirit is represented in the Bible under the picture of a mother. The allusion in the third chapter of John to our being born of the Spirit is most distinct in this direction, and the very picture is full of tenderness. All we know of the Holy Spirit is in the direction of gentleness and love. The favorite emblem, the dove, is suggestive of nothing but tenderness. For the love of the Spirit needs no other proof than the very fact that for centuries this blessed one has chosen for his abode this uncongenial world of sin and sorrow. Scarcely do we realize, perhaps, that while the second person of the Trinity condescended to live on earth for 33 years, the third person has had no other home since the time of Christ. Thank God. For a man among men, the Lord Jesus. Thank God for a dove among doves, the Holy Spirit, who can yet come from heaven to take anyone and everyone who knows Christ as Savior to his bosom and can enfold us in his huge, protective wings of love. Thank God. God, for the wings of a dove. Father, thank you today for this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful picture you have painted in your word and that you can yet reveal to your children by your Holy Spirit in revelation. Thank you, Lord, for this symbol of peace, this symbol of sacrifice you make possible, this symbol of of love that we so desperately need. Thank you, Lord. You can enfold not only your children, but you can enfold your church, each and every local fellowship with a corporate anointing, appointing, and equipping. And oh, how you hold the local fellowship to your heart, how you surround us with your wings of love, how you look at us tenderly, with eyes of compassion we've never seen before. And yet at one and the same time, you can look up and out from us in a different manner with eyes like flames of fire, warning anyone and anything that would dare presume to cause us harm that they will have to deal with you. And Father, they should fear the sword of the Lord much more than the beak of a bird. Bless these words to our heart this morning. Help us to stand tall in the protection, provision, and love that is ours in you. Bless those who stand with us in ministry. Bless those who pray, who attend, who serve, who support. Bless those out around the tri-state across America and all around the world that partner with an apostolic ministry to get the, the gospel of grace and glory to the ends of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for putting your seal of approval on this new book and let it do its work in the hearts and lives of many from all different faith groups, churches, and denominations. Meet us, Lord, as we come around your table this morning. 
and dine with you. Partake of your risen flesh and blood in, with, and under the bread and cup of this supper. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. You that are watching by Facebook, perhaps live or YouTube or archived, if you've not been to the Lord's table for some time, we encourage you to join us today. We're going to get ready here. We encourage you to get ready there. Just take a bit of bread, grape juice, settle in your heart and mind that you're going to be dining on planet Earth, but also in heaven because of this beautiful sacramental union that the Lord makes possible, whereby after we pray over these emblems and distribute them and they're received and words of institution are spoken, we can actually partake of not just bread and cup, but at one and the same time, the risen body and blood of Jesus given to us in the supper that he provided. Amen. centuries before he opened the entrance of heaven so strangers could pass through its doors and few men would listen and less would believe an invisible kingdom they could not conceive he suffered a death that per And he promised we'd live there forever If only through faith we'd believe Wise men still seek him And no one can say That this man named Jesus Is not who he claims He rose from the dead And he lives with me still Today
going to do part of the Lord's Supper today. Is that all right? It means so much to me again this morning. I got a very complimentary email from my Greek guru today. It just meant the world to me. He's just starting to read my book. Just had some very, very kind things to say. <clears throat> Would you like to hear what it sounded like? I need to practice. Let's gather around the Lord's table as the disciples did on that first Lord's Supper. Third Passover they celebrated together, but it was like none other because after the meal, something else happened, something new, something wonderful. If you don't have my new book, please take one with you. The Lord's Supper. There's so much information about so many subjects apart from and in addition to the Lord's Supper. It'll be a blessing. Praise the name of Jesus. And after the supper, having given thanks, he took bread, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Lavate fayete, tuto estin to sumamo. Take, eat, this is my body. Doimon klomenon kedidomenon, the one that is constantly being broken and given for you. Bite tuto estin amina nanmisin. Do this as often as you eat it in the remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed. in Greek too. Less than you give the translation. This is Luke's account. After dinner, after the supper, he took the cup in the same way. Having given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to them, saying, This is my blood of the New Testament, the one constantly being poured out for many for the remission of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. Oh, sorry. Bless the Lord. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Solomon, would you pray a prayer of thanksgiving for the body and blood this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Father, we glorify you, we glorify, we glorify you. You are holy. You are holy. You've given us this gift, the greatest gift you could possibly give your own son, the one dearest to you, the one most important, the one that you've made the worlds through, the one for whom you've made the worlds, the one through whom you've redeemed the worlds. We glorify you, Lord, for this gift. We thank you and praise you for this unassailable master, this invincible Lord, this glorious King, this holy lamb set apart before you created anything. We thank you, Lord, for your son. We thank you for this blood. We thank you for his body. We thank you for all that he is. We thank you for who he is, for his obedience, for his love. We thank you for his long suffering, his patience. We thank you for his unending grace and forgiveness. 
and never saying no. We thank you, Lord, for this body that he gave for us, that he willingly gave up, sacrificing himself by your spirit. We thank you for this blood that breaks every chain, that redeems us from every sin, past, present, future, that washes it all away. We thank you, Lord, for this total and complete gift that is your son. Amen. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hey, a couple of items, and, and you can go get the food. Um, this directory is available now. There's some up here on the front. If you're in this, take one. If you're not, of course. But if you're in this, take one. And once everybody has one, you can get an extra maybe. Look at the back of this, okay? If you're interested in helping out in any of these ways, let us know. You might want to help give out communion. Talk to, talk to someone that's already doing it. How do, how do you do that? Um, you know, what's involved? You might want to distribute tracts. Might Poor Cliff, you might want to be a greeter. We used to have couples greeting. We would alternate them. And it's all fallen on him. Wouldn't it be nice for him to have a break once in a while? If you'd like to be a morning greeter. Um, uh, church cleaning at C Sharp. You might need a break by now. Uh, Sunday school, definitely we need people to kind of help out, nursery. And so if you see something back here that intrigues you, um, talk to the person that's doing it or talk to me and see what's involved. And it very well may be you're, you're going to be entering into a ministry you didn't even think you could do or, or didn't know what a blessing it would be. Amen? We already prayed over the blessing, uh, the, prayed over the food, the blessing, so go for it. Amen? If you need prayer, well, we're here. But the food's there. Prayer or food? Prayer or food? Your choose. Yahweh blesses us and protects us. Yahweh makes his face shine on us and is gracious, merciful, and benevolent toward us. Yahweh blesses us with his peace. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.